Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funkin' Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership singer and composer James D. Train Williams best known as one half of the popular 1980s dance R&B funk duo D-Train. Heen keyboard playing partner Hubert Eves III teamed up for five albums that included seven top 40 R&B hits. Among them was the number one dance smash, You're the One for Me, an all-time club classic. Williams returned with the album 701 Franklin Avenue in 2009, and throughout his career has lent his vocals to numerous well-known performers. Those include Patty Austin, Kirk Whalum, George Howard, Freddie Jackson, Cher, Elton John, Ellie Cole, Aaron Carter, Luther Vandross, Vanessa Williams, and Lenny Kravitz. James, how are you? I am good, my friend. How are you, Scott? I'm good excellent. To good to see you. Thank you for joining the good show. Good to be on the mothership. I started my career on the mothership with George Clinton, <laughs> opened it up for him for about, ooh, about three years. Wow, nice. Well, the Miller Sound Express, that, that, that truck that used to go across the country with all the funk acts on it. It was the Miller Sound Express, and then they had the Cool Jazz Fest truck. And so if we were on one tour, the Cool Jazz truck always had Cool in the gang and them guys, and that was a little bit more reserved. And then the Miller Sound Express had all the funk groups, D-Train, Babyface when he was in the deal, um, Secret Weapon, um, Midnight Star, Atlantic Star, Star Point, Peebo Bryson. <laughs> Why Peebo Bryson was in the middle of that, I have no idea. But yeah. <laughs> it just didn't match up. <laughs> but it's good to be here, man. Yeah. So, and you're coming to us from Las Vegas, right? Yes, sir. Summerland. I love it out here. Uh, the, you know, it's cold out here to me now. It's, the weather is like 52 degrees today. But you know what? I will take that over eight degrees in snow in New York City the way it is right now. My daughter and them, they had a nor'easter yesterday, which was a possible, um, I forgot when to get a lot of snow. It, they got about two feet of snow up there. Mm -mm. And I said, I don't miss my shovel. I don't miss my snowblower. I don't miss nothing. I loved it in the summertime in Long Island. But in the winter, ooh, 
I think the highest amount of snow, they had almost four feet of snow. I was out there for 28 years, and I think the worst snowstorm, it was almost like four feet of snow. My car was underneath the snow. And I had to start at the top of my trunk to get to the snow, man. It's how bad it was. Wow. You know, so I don't miss that bending over and shoveling or any of that stuff. What, was it just last year when they actually saw a little bit of snow in Las Vegas? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. They sure did. They sure did. I moved out here. It's funny. I missed that because I moved here in January 2021. So we, I kind of missed that snowstorm that they had. Um, so I've been here since then and, and, you know, working on getting a residency out here. Um, lots of musical opportunities, um, but I still do my work around the country and around the world. Um, and I got several concerts lined up in uh, Europe for the springtime, the festivals. So I'm glad that the world is opening up because everything has been shut for two and a half years. Uh, it's nice for somebody to call you from London and say, hey, James, we'd like to see you at the O2. And it was a show that was canceled, um, actually. It was me, Alexander O'Neill. Melba Moore, um, Robin S., I believe, and oh, I can't remember, and, and Alexander O'Neill. But um, so that got canceled, and now it's happening again. So I'm glad for that. And then we're supposed to do Greece. It's my first time in Athens, Greece, uh, with G. Bello in Light of the World, who lives in London. Uh, so I'll be, it's going to be interesting. Wow, that sounds interesting. Good luck with oh, all yeah. that. And, uh, well, you know, it's fun to do it 40 years later. I think it's more fun now than it is when you're younger. Because when you're younger, you're ignorant. <laughs> Say You get to places like France and you're like, I don't speak the language, so I'm not going outside. No, I'm just going to stay here and have room service. Thank you. <laughs> right. Right. Also, can when you're so young, it's kind of overwhelming and you're thinking about it other is. stuff rather than really taking in. Maybe everything. Well, when, when, when the record hit really big in the UK, we were called to do Top of the Pops. Now, I had already done Soul Train in LA with Don Cornelius. I didn't know what Top of the Pops was, and I didn't know how popular it was. But Top of the Pops was like the equivalent to Dick Clark's um, American Bandstand for all of Europe, especially the UK. So I was on there. I went there, and when I got there, Elton John was in the green because he was at friends with Sting. And it was sort of the down, I want to say not the downside of his career, because disco had went away. And the, the, his era of pop music up to that point, it kind of went away. And new music was coming in. So he was just sitting there chilling in the green room waiting for Sting and the police. They were performing synchronicity on top of the pops. And we got to meet them. And then we went on and did, I think, George Duke was on the same show. They were Stanley Clark uh, performing from their album. So I did top of, over the years, I've done Top of the Pops four times and Soul Train five times in two countries. Four times in L.A. And then one time when Don Cornelius was trying to expand in Europe, he had Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Daniels from Shalimar as the host in London, England, because Jeffrey was living in London. I believe Jeffrey still does. So um, New York uh, was where you ha hail from, right? Brooklyn, right? Oh, yeah. 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 So and growing up, uh, when did you first realize you, you had a voice and, uh, you know, that maybe this would be a thing for you? Well, I tell you what, Scott, I was six years old and I grew up in the Church of God in Christ in Brooklyn, New York, under Bishop and Madam F.D. Washington. Uh, Ronnie Dyson, who had, if you let me make love to you, then why can't I touch you? He was our choir director before he went out, as they say, into the world. <laughs> he was uh, he was the choir director and the lead singer. And then uh, Reverend Timothy Wright was our organist. Um, and Al Sharpton was the junior church minister for the youth hmm. uh, before he went into politics. So, you know. We had a nice church and it was packed every Sunday. It was like a mega church because we had about, I want to say 800 to 1,000 people every Sunday morning. And so um, when I turned six years old, uh, I was in the youth choir and they asked me to sing this song, Can't Turn Around Now, that they had written. 
And so I get up there and I'm singing and I'm going, oh, no, I can't, can't turn around now. Can't turn around. Oh, can't turn around. And the preachers started laughing because I added the steps to it. I, you know, I, I was like, well, it just seems boring if you're just going to stand here and sing the song. So as a little kid, I got creative with it. Oh, no, I can't. Can't turn around. And I started turning around and looking at the past, and he bust out laughing. And that was when I discovered I could sing. Um, my mother had prepped me to sing that solo that Sunday. She said, Now, baby, let me tell you something. If you get scared, just look at the back of the church, stare at the back of the church. Mama's watching you, but you don't have to be afraid. <laughs> just look at the back of the church because she was afraid I was going to forget the words or whatever. But as a little kid, six years old, I remember the entire song, sang it. So I wound up being a lead vocalist for the church all the way up until I was like 18. And then, you know, I kind of stopped. You know, when you, you turn 18, you want to party, man. You want to go. And I was playing football, too. I was like, man, I'm getting drunk at the football party. I'm getting, they got a keg of beer. I'm done, man. See ya. And, mm -hmm. and that was it, you know, with the church thing. Um, but I had always continued singing. Um I did my first professional recording at the age of 15 with Reverend Timothy Wright on the album called Victory in the Praise. And I sang the title song, Victories in the Praise. I believe I was 15 years old. Um, and, and I was in junior high school. So I had to take out of school. They had to ask my mother for permission to let me do the session. Mother Smith, can James sing? Said, we just gonna take, we'll drive them down. We'll drive them home. And so... They took me to the session. I sang the song. Uh, it was a studio in Lower Manhattan. And uh, we did that. And then uh, when I was in Brooklyn College, I competed against the Phi Beta Sigma uh, so, uh, fraternity. And they thought the Phi Beta Sigma, you know, that's a big thing in college, the, the Phi Beta Sigma and the Deltas and, you know, all of that crap. I was not going to join them because I thought they were stupid, like a gang. And I just felt that they were all ignorant because they all walked around the school with bow ties and dressed up in suits. And I was like, you're a nerd. And then, you know, I just didn't like it. And then uh, we were in a competition uh, based off of the old television show, The Gong Show. And so I competed. I sang... Um, Everything Must Change by George Benson. And they did their steps, you know, they, and every all the girls loved the five band against the Sigma guys because they did step shows and came. And I won. I came in first place. I was shocked. I was like, what? And they were shocked. And so ever since then, I said, I'd like to make a career out of this. Um, I got a call from Will Downing one day, who I went to high school with. I was in my first year of college, Will was still in Erasmus in his last year. But Will had write, started writing songs in college, in high school, uh, writing with Freddie Jackson, from Melba Moore, so many artists on RCA. So he said, I got this demo that I'm doing for myself. Can you come in and sing backgrounds on it? I said, sure, I'd love to. So, oh, excuse me, I meet him at the studio. And I start singing backgrounds. And he said, I want you to do some step out leads. I said, OK. So I said, go ahead. So this, the door opens up to the, to the studio room, and Hubert Eves walks in. And Hubert sits down. He has Chinese food because he hadn't eaten for the day, and he's, he didn't meet me yet. And Will was going to introduce me at the end of the song. So he's sitting there eating his food. And Will said, all right, D, go ahead. Boom. So he started playing the track, and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and Will was like, and Hubert was eating Chinese food. He goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, let me put you <laughs> He dropped the sticks for his Chinese food. He put it on the console. And he's like, and he just sat like he was amazed for the rest of the session until I was finished. Being Joe Cool, the way Hubert is. So he got his composure. And at the end of the session, he's like, yeah, man, good job. <laughs> he was hiding all of this. This craziness, when I left the studio and went home, caught the train and went home, you know, Will calls my house that night. He, man, Cuban, loved your voice. He's so excited, man. He's been writing music for a while, and he tried me out on it, but it didn't work because I'm a baritone. Man, he wants your number. Is it okay if I give him your mom's number? Because back then, you didn't have cell phones. So I said, sure, man, call my mom's house. And 
I talked to him. So we made a meeting to meet the very following weekend. I went to his house and he had a studio set up in his base, basement with a two inch quarter tapes, you know, stereo thing out. So I went over there and he said, man, I got this track, man. I love it. But I, I only got one thing and I can't come up with nothing else. I said, all right, play it. So then he said, I'll sing it while it plays. And it went, I'll stand up on the cloud. Shout out loud. You're the one for me. See, that's all I got. That's all I got, man. That's all I got. So I said, all right, all right, calm down. Play it again. So he plays it. And then it went into the verse part. And I said, give me a pen. Give me a pen. Give me a pen. And it, it gives me, I said, you got some paper? So he had a pad. And I started writing. With this new love, I found. Takes my feet up on the ground to fly away. Hmm. With this new love, I did. Takes away my And we started writing together. That day, we finished You're the One for Me within an hour. We wrote that song within an hour. And then recorded it to two-inch tape. And, uh, and then he continued working on the music. And then we went to Sound Lab Recording Studio, which we use for all of our albums, in Brooklyn, New York, out on 14th Street between Avenue Z and Shore Parkway with Peter Diorio. And we went into, and Mike Potash, who was the assist system engineer. And let me tell you, it was love at first sight. I mean, I love Pete and Mike. God rest Pete, so he passed. Mike's still around. He's a school teacher. I think he's in North Carolina or South Carolina. And, um, you know, we recorded our entire album there, and it got picked up by Prelude because all the major labels said I couldn't sing. They said, he sucks, man. You need to get a girl on that song. Listen to him. He's too loud. For God's sake, he's singing so hard. His old father, Hubert's father, said, man, you better get somebody else to sing this song. He, he's just too loud. It's just obnoxious. You know, he said, I can't listen to it at a loud level, man. I need you to get somebody smooth. Somebody smooth who can sing it. And Hubert stuffed his guns. Columbia Records turned us down. Capitol Records, RCA. Um, everybody who was a major label turned us down. So he went to Prelude Records. He had a meeting with Marvin Schlachter. Marvin loved the record, him and Stan Hoffman. They signed us to Prelude. And the rest was history. We did the album. Uh, but the album, actually, the single actually broke in the clubs. At the underground club where, that was uh, where Larry Levant was DJing every week in the Paradise Garage in New York, which was the Studio 54 after Studio 54 closed down. Because after the disco era, Studio 54 was like under construction. I don't know what they turned it into, but most of the, the clubs, like, you know, Bonds International, they turned them into shoe stores. You know, the hip factory now is now condominiums. So, you know, um, so we we broke it at, at uh, Paradise Garage and then Frankie Crocker, who was the premier DJ on radio, um, broke it on uh, Kiss FM. And uh, we went in and did an interview with him and the rest was history. We started doing television, radio, and went to number one in Billboard. Um, let, let me let me jump in with a couple of questions, if I could, because it's a great sure. story and uh, just an amazing story. And oh yeah, you know, um, when you first heard that hook and that track of what Hubert had, did uh -huh. you think immediately it was going to be hit, or did you think oh, it's kind of interesting, or what was your feeling about it? I thought it was interesting because he was the first musician outside of church that I'd worked with. I went up to that point. I, I did gospel and hearing dance music like that. I didn't know what it was. I don't think either one of us knew what we were doing. And that was the blessing for it. we were both ignorant to. Hubert was it comes from a jazz background, you know, Gary Bartz, um, McCoy Tyman. Um, Roberta Flack, he comes from that background, and him too, man. I came from the church background. So when he's putting together these tracks, we didn't even know what it was. We didn't know what Keep On was. We just, we wanted to compete. And there was nothing out there like us at the time. You know, the biggest artist on Prelude when we got there was Franz Jolie. Hmm. And she was their headline, so she was their Madonna. Big time disco, yeah. 
and the Strikers and the Nick Striker Band and Unlimited Touch. Those were their headline acts. So we were just two guys from Brooklyn and just hopefully, can we get in the door? Can we be part of the team? You know? Wow. Great surprise um, to both of us that we went number one in Billboard. And once we hit number one, television shows started calling the radio station started calling we wound up going on a promo tour we got invited to the Miller sound express by george clinton to open up for him we wound up opening up for Smokey robinson at radio city music hall in 85 uh we did um in 1985 we also wound up going to london england to do um and this is after being on top of the pop several times we did London GLC against Apartheid. They were trying to free Nelson Mandela at the time. And the GLC combined with Stevie Wonder. And they had a two-day festival at Wembley Arena, which holds 17,000 to 20,000 people. That was the first time that this Brooklyn boy saw that many people in an arena that, that came to see him. You know, they had, the press was out there. And that was my first concert where I was like, oh, crap, they like my music. <laughs> <laughs> so that was cool man two questions come to mind one is um were there a couple of singers that were like big influences on you that were like your favorite singers that you tried to emulate or oh who, yes who, 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 who my was... favorite singer at the time in doing the d-train records which hubert had to pull me out of his shadow was dj rogers dj rogers had hmm. say you love me and I wanted to be like DJ Rogers. Say you love me. Say you. I just loved his voice. And I love Peebo Bryce. Feel the fire. And, and we'd go in the studio. We're singing You're the One for Me. And I'm like, he said, no, 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 no. You can't sing that. That's DJ Rogers' thing. You got to be d -trained. And he taught me. That's one of the things Hubert taught me. Be yourself. You know, because you can emulate a bunch of people. But you really got to be yourself for this to, to come off. And so he, he coached me through that session. And then from that session on, I started to get comfortable with my own vocal style. Um, but there were a lot that influenced me. Walter Hawkins in gospel. Edwin Hawkins, who had Oh Happy Day. Um, I loved DJ Rogers at the time, Peebo. Teddy Pendergrass mm -hmm. was another one that uh, really influenced me. Michael Jackson. Bar none and the Jackson Five was my biggest influence on in getting to music, period. Because when I was eight years old, they came on the Ed Sullivan show. Sunday night, seven o'clock. And we got a really good show for you tonight. Uh, from Gary and Diana, here's the Jackson Five. Oh my God. Every long, young little black kid in America went, ah, my sister started kissing the TV set because it was the first year they had television in color. And, and they was like crazy over these guys. And I was like, wow, I want to be like them. You know, I, I, I want to be like Jermaine playing the bass and, and Tito playing the guitar. You know, I like Michael, but I like the musicianship of Jermaine and Tito. And uh, my dad said, OK, you want to study guitar? I said, yeah, because every day I'd run to the broom closet and take out a broom and I'd start doing this. He says, OK. We're going to get you in school. And from the age of nine to about 14, 15, I studied guitar at Fort Hamilton, New York. And that was my introduction to real music, musicianship, you know. Um, and I, I love where it took me because I keep this thing on my desk that says, it's, it's a thing that says love. Life takes us to unexpected places, but love always brings us home. And, and that's been my journey so far. It's taken me to the heights. I mean, I, I, I kind of left New York because there was no, nothing else for me to achieve there. You know, I have, I've done everybody's. I, we were doing Meatloaf, Bat Out of Hell, too. You know, singing on everybody's record. Natalie Cole, Snowfall on the Sahara. Doing, I did Cher's album, the Believe album, singing on the, the Power. Um, you know, did movies with uh, Ed Norton and and, and uh, Ben Stiller, Keeping the Faith, and The Perfect Stranger with Bruce Willis and Halle Berry, and the Pokemon movie and the Hercules television show. and uh, I mean, the Hercules movie and the Pokemon television show. So when you've done all these things, 
Um, and as a New Yorker, I guess it continued into about 2015 when I got the call uh, to sing for the Pope, which is probably my biggest accolade to yet. He, Pope Francis came to New York on his New York visit. And I get a call from my buddy, Rob Mathis, uh, who I've worked with for the past 30 years. I've known him. Uh, we do Christmas concerts every year with, with Vanessa Williams. Sting sometimes comes and sits in. Um, he said, D, man, would you like to sing for the Pope? The pre-mass ceremony is going to be at Madison Square Garden. It's going to be a cool gig. And me, I'm, you know, I'm a, I got, I'm a New York head. So I think like a New York musician. We work with everybody in the business, from Shania Twain to Billy Joel. To, so yeah, I'm thinking, of, yeah, okay, dude, it's another gig. Yeah, all right. How much does it pay? You ain't thinking, Pope Francis. You're like, how much does it pay? And what time do I got to be there? That's it. So we get there, and security was through the roof because it's the Pope. And so I'm backstage, and my son, I got him a ticket to get in, and two of my friends, one from Sirius XM, Kathy Baruso, and my friend, uh, Kathy I. and Cohn, from where I worked at United Stations Radio Networks. So we, the three of us are there, and they're like, you know, I'm in my dressing room. Rosanna Scotto is coming in from New York News, and she's going to be one of the hosts. And then she's standing there, she's going, oh, my God, I, th I think he's going in his dressing room. And I'm like, who's going in there? She says, Martin Sheen. I said, the Martin Sheen? She says, yeah. Being me, it's got me and me. I walk strolling down the hall. Hey, Mr. Sheen, how you doing? I love your movies. And just, Come on in here, kid. He's an old school Hollywood guy. What year, what year was this, Jim? 2015, October. And so he goes, come on in here, kid. And I said, okay. Me and my son go in there. He goes, what do you got to do? What are you doing here tonight? I said, well, I have to sing, Mr. Sheen. And I tell you, I'm so nervous. There's four verses to on Eagle's Wings. I know it's a big Catholic jam song, but I have to sing all four verses with the orchestra and know the cues, and I'm scared. I'm nervous. He goes, listen, kid, here's what you do. If you lose the words, just start singing Amazing Grace. Come on, sing it with me. Amazing. Because he's a really serious, devout Catholic, Martin Sheen. So me and my son Starts singing Amazing Grace with Martin Sheen in his dressing room. Of course, social media being what it is. Everybody standing in the doorway with a cell phone going, I'm trying to sing it with Martin Sheen. Let me see if I can get this on film. And I have it. Um, and me and my son sang Amazing Grace in three-part harmony with Martin Sheen. He was the host of the show before uh, Pope Francis got there. And the other entertainers were Harry Connick Jr., um, Gloria Stefan. Norm Lewis, who was the first black phantom of the opera star. Um, and I forgot the soprano. She was a mezzo soprano that was there. And I think Jennifer Hudson was there. And uh, those were the other performers. So, I, you know, I was in good company. And Martin was, you know, we just talked. And, you know, and he gave me his number and everything. I said, no, 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 no. You don't have to give me a number. He says, this is my house. Call me. I was like, okay. Okay, I can do that. Because <laughs> it's like, you know, back in the day, they used to have a commercial. When E.F. Hutton talks, everybody listens. Yeah. When Martin Sheen talks, D. Trade is all ears. <laughs> and it was fun. And I called him several times. He ain't never called me back, but, you know, <laughs> I did reach the landline. Yeah. All right. All right. Martin Sheen, watch this and call James back. That's right. Uh, wow. Hey, um, that's an amazing experience. What, <laughs> what, what was the experience like um, when you first heard yourself on the radio? Well, you know what? We were driving down Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, Hubert and myself, and we were on our way to do the interview with radio, uh, radio host Frankie Crocker. And they played the B-side first. They played the instrumental. And we're listening to it, and it comes on, and I'm like, okay. I hear the music. So I turned to Hubert. I was like, Let me took my voice off the song. You want me to be part of this? You took my voice off the song. Why did you take me off the record? I was, I was telling everybody I made a record, man. Watch it. And Hubert was like, calm down, calm down. They're playing the B-side. I was like, oh, I didn't know there was a B-side. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we get to the station, and Frankie plays the, the, the regular version. And, and then I was happy. And it was exciting because hearing yourself on the radio was so exciting to me. Um, now you felt like you belong, You had a place where you belong. And being a kid from where I was from in Bedside, Brooklyn, a lot of kids don't make it out of there alive, much less with college scholarships or, you know, unless they get, you know, they, they get, it's the hood, it's the ghetto, you know. And some guys make it out of there by being drug dealers. Some guys, you know, that I grew up, and most of them aren't here anymore. Uh, and then some of them try to do it through sports. Very few, uh, you got a lot of them that do it through academics and become smart. But that number compared to those that take the other route is a very small number. Um, it didn't even out. So being on the radio let me know, and my parents know, I had a career. I could do this. Um, and it was wonderful because we were doing four shows a weekend, four to five shows a weekend, because I was working Friday night doing two shows, Saturday night doing two shows, and then sometimes on a Sunday. The money was great. It's rolling in. Uh, my girlfriend had just gotten pregnant with my son, my then wife, and I was going to make her my wife. Um, so it was great. It was a really great time for me. Um, you, you know, I, I got to tell you at that time, you know, I was a club disc jockey and a mobile disc jockey. And so, wow. you know, all the records that came out, they came through me, you know, everything that I was on top of things before most people. And so, mm -hmm. you know, a record like yours was so important and prominent, you know, in keeping the dance floors cooking, you know? And <laughs> so I really appreciate that. And one of the things that really captivated me about your vocal style is, you know, it had such urgency and you had like such conviction in the mm -hmm. delivery, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, I always thought that maybe, you know, being from having that football background and, and I think there's a little bit of a, a crossover a commonality between uh, athletic pursuits and being competitive in that way. And then also kind of translating that into entertaining and performing. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking that some of that, you know, came through you that way too. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I made a promise to my mother, you know, because like I said, I grew up in the church and you had to get the pastor's permission to sort of leave the church and go out into the world and pursue music. The ones that came before me was Ronnie Dyson. And unfortunately, Ronnie got into the business, but got caught up in the business and became a heroin addict and died of AIDS. Um, before him was Sammy Fletcher. Sammy Fletcher was based out of L.A. And he had records in the 50s and 60s with the soul groups. He never made it big, big, but he did have some records. So I'm the third one to come out of there, and I had to get permission. Because they, they say you get caught up in the business, and they didn't want my life ruined by this business. Because some people, this business can take away your soul. And you're right about the athletic thing. Um, being a football player and being competitive, I wanted to compete in this business. Because, like, when I played football, one thing I made sure of, I was going to start. I was going to be the starting defensive tackle. I wasn't going to be riding the pine, substituting me. In for, no, I'm going to be the starting defensive tackle. And when I said that to my mind, I made sure that happened on the field. When we got into the record business, that part of it played into um, my physique at the time. I was kind of husky. So it helped because there was nobody out there that was like Luther wasn't out yet in 1981. So, you know, he didn't come out to like 1983. Um, so I was the big kid on the block at the time, so to speak. And the conviction came from the church, absolutely from the church. I promised my mother, and I keep that promise to this day, that if I can't sing it in front of her, I'm not going to sing it at all. So I never wrote songs with curse lyrics and swearing words in it um, because I, and then at that point I had kids. So, I want, you know, you don't want your kids, kids to hear you saying F this and that. Yeah. Even when the styles of music changed into hip hop, my album 701 Franklin Avenue, I said it may not get heard a lot of places. Uh, it was really an album for my mother who had started with dementia and it got worse. And she eventually passed in 06. So 
by 2009, I had finished the whole album. And most of those, they weren't polished masters. They were mainly demos that I had mixed out in L.A. And three copies sold in China. Because <laughs> they wrote me on Facebook and from Japan, and it was like, oh, Domo Arigato, Mr. D. Train, we love your record over there. And I was like, oh, you bought it? <laughs> but, you know, conviction is something that I still have to this day. Simply because when you're younger, it's about the competition. And that, that involves more of your ego, which means easing God out. Ego is something where you ease God out and you depend totally on your own abilities to me. When you get older, it's a more spiritual journey for me. I'm 60 years old. So it's about whose life can I help? Whose mind can I change? And, and D-Train's music, I, when I was at Sirius Radio and I was a host, guys would write me from prison, telling me that they're never getting out. And they listen to Sirius XM in prison. I was like, really? Y'all get radio or jail? You know, but they, the prison system has Sirius XM radio. And sometimes they can get individual radios. And they were listening to me on the air. And they started writing me and asking me to play them my songs from prison. So I, I realized that what you say is one thing. But what you do matters more than what you say. Everybody got great speeches. Everybody got, you know, inspiring words. But are you going to live up to that standard? See, I learned that all along my journey, character is what defines you when everybody else leaves the room. Hey, you, you mentioned that uh, 701 Franklin Avenue album, and I was going to bring it up after talking about some of your earlier ones, but since you mentioned it, I wanted mm -hmm. to just tell you how impressed I was with that record. And, oh, wow. Thank you. And, and, and I wanted to mention some of the highlights for me, Okay, uh, to, you know, so uh, I really like feel the fire, which uh, uh, is kind of a slow, funky Prince. Right. Vibe. Yeah. Uh, tell me when the madness ends. Oh, okay. Got some hip hop influence in there, but that's cool. Absolutely. Uh, when you're going to wake up mm -hmm. again, some print, you know, I'm a big Prince head. So, right. Uh, Devil left hell. That one, like some Curtis Mayfield, maybe slipping in yep, there. That, that, oh, you got it. You got it. I definitely wanted to go to Curtis Mayfield because, you know, and it was a political statement for me. It was like George Bush had gotten elected the second term. And I was like, uh, <laughs> the devil left hell and he lives up in the White House. <laughs> Yeah. So thank I, you, man, because you know, I I believe on that album, even though I didn't get to do the production big like I wanted to, I think the songs spoke for themselves. They were honest, they were true to me as a musician. Um and I think it honored my mother in the right way. Uh later on I'll probably have it remastered and have some instrumentation added. Uh and I'll get that to you as soon as I do that. But right now. I'm working on my current album. Uh, James, back to, um, I want to ask you about Hubert. Uh -huh. You know, he's been a, a partner of yours for so long and you guys collaborate on such, you know, great material together. What can mm -hmm. you share with viewers about him as a talent, as a person? As a talent, as a talent, I don't know a keyboard player out there that's bad at Hubert is. And I mean all of it. There's few that come up in his echelon. And those would be the McCoy Tyners, the Chick Careers, you know what I mean? The Herbie Hancocks. They can get down. Hubert can get down the room with them. Even though he looks up to them, a lot of them look up to him also because, see, he, he went outside of the piano, jazz piano range into organic instrumentation through synth. He changed the, the game in the synth world where you're the one for me. Because people thought it was a bunch of different keyboard players. They didn't know it was Hubert running around the room playing Prophet 5. Then he go to the Oberheim. Then he go to the Moog Source. Then he go to, he did that for weeks and went from different key. And it was like looking at a prince because he plays drums, he plays bass, and he plays keyboards. And so he was playing everything on that first album. Um, the only thing that he didn't play on, you're the other one for me. 
I can't think, was the drums. And the drums was Howard King. On all of our first album, all the drums was either Howard King. And then one song, I believe he had his son play, Little Hugh. And Little Hugh was like 15, 16. So he gave his son, you know, a little the bit fourth. of love and, and had him play. And But you know what? It was right, rightfully so, because Little Hugh could play since he was young. Uh, he could play drums since he was young. He picked up the bass when he was about 17. And that boy mastered the bass, mastered the drums, and wound up playing, being the drummer and the bass player for um, Salisa Culp, Jane. Okay. He was the drummer and the bass player. So they were switching. <clears throat> some days he played the bass, some days he played the drums. You know, and then the drums, when they did Madison Square Garden, they got him in a cage. And he's 18 years old, man. He was brilliant. And he still is. He has a new album out. But we need to protect our lineage and our heritage musically because when it's gone, it ain't coming back. It's just, and it's, and it's, it's, we got a little light of hope in there because of Bruno Mars. Because yeah. Bruno is a kid who studied his history. He knows what that was. And he goes back and gets it. And that's why the stuff he's singing, I heard the stylistic singing. You know, I'm not new to this stuff. I, you know, I listened to the Manhattan singing back in the 70s. It's regurgitated to me, but it's wonderful and refreshing to see a kid who, and I worked with him at the Kennedy Center on his backing him up for the Sting tribute. This kid plays the guitar well. He plays the piano well. He plays the drums. He plays the bass. He is an all-around masterful musician. He can walk into any room and play any instrument like Prince. That's why he's the anomaly and the exception in today's music industry. Because when you look at most of the other ones, it's all about programming. You program in loops. They're not even playing keyboards. They're programming keyboard loops that might have been played by George Duke so from records. Because Puffy started that. Let's keep that honest. Puff Daddy started that by sampling people back in the early 90s. Um, got away with it. You know, he played the, played the sampler, right? But made him a millionaire because he was smart business minded. Well, I, and, think of, you know, I think of MC Hammer, too. Is a yeah, part MC of that Hammer. Too, you know? Yeah, Coolio, you know? All of those guys. Um, the only ones that I say, and I used to think the West Coast rappers didn't do that. But when I went, you know, this is the year that I'm exercising my reversionary rights in the music industry, where when you're a 35-year writer, all your rights revert back over to you. So my attorneys is exercising that, and you have to send out termination notices to all the labels, whoever recorded your record. Well, little bit known to me, when you go through, there's a, a, a website called you, Who Sampled Me? And we had to get that information for the attorney. And by the time I got to the 12th page, <laughs> Scott, I was like, I was and that was only on You're the One for Me. We didn't even get to keep on. You're the One for Me had 12 pages of people from New York, around the world, DJs who have sampled it, used it, and everything. I didn't know that Dr. Dre and NWA sampled You're the One For Me on their first album and used it on a song called Fun, sold six and a half million copies. Hmm. I didn't know uh, Puff Daddy until I heard it, uh, 92, Biggie, Life After Death, Sky Is The Limit. That's Keep On. And up to this point, what? He's up to like 30 million in sales on that record. Never paid me a dime. You know what I mean? So you look at these things, and yeah, I'm, I'm not part of their, I get paid intellectual rights from the radio airplane. Um, but from the sales, they should compensate us as writers as well on the sales. So those are different things that we're dealing with. Uh, nowadays, as well as putting out my new album. My new album is entitled uh, D-Train. Um, my full name now is no longer James Williams. Uh, since moving to Vegas, I changed my name legally in my um, my legal name on my license, social security card. I'm trying to get my birth certificate changed. <laughs> I don't know if my mother would like that, but uh, uh, I get my birth certificate changed, and everything here is D-Train. 
which I'm really proud of because what I did in 2015 also, I trademarked the name D-Train. So I now own the name D-Train for all thing entertainment. Um, I did it after they, everybody called me for a movie that was done by Jack Black called All Aboard the D-Train. And I was like, what? You, what? you know, and, and it was, it was a, the movie didn't do too well. It got all of those, what do you call it? Bananas or whatever. It, it Ras raspberries. Yeah, raspberries. It got a bunch of raspberries and it came out and it went. I was glad about that. So I trademarked the name for all things entertainment. Um, and it's it's not, you know, the great thing about what I do now, Scott, and you probably can testify to this. We've, we've accomplished a great deal in our lives. But right now, it's no longer about us. It's about what we leave behind to our kids, our grandkids, our wives, the ones that we love. And it's not a death speech like we can ready to leave here. But right now, before, it was about history, burning a path in history. Now it's about creating legacy. And legacy contains more than you and your ego. Legacy is like, when, when I go, you put me six feet under, my grandson becomes Detroit. You know, that's, that's the way I'm setting it up. My grandson, he becomes Detroit. And I'm setting it up in my will like that and everything. So I didn't tell him or my daughter. He's only five, but. <laughs> that, well, that, that's why I started this show five years ago because you wow. know my I lost my father and I was like I'm you know what wow I was like you know what um, this is a passion and I want to make sure that the legacies of these great artists are not mm -hmm. forgotten and that's left for others to discover and to keep it alive and right. so many were passing away oh. you know and we're losing so many greats like you had mentioned we just lost him too many. But even ones that, you know, were not as successful or famous as Mtume was, you know, and maybe don't even have as much exposure and fame as he does, but mm -hmm. were part of so many great songs and albums and works of musical art and in R&B and funk and jazz. And I need to preserve it and I need to help that happen uh, for generations to come. And also, you know, so my own son, too, appreciates the importance of that type of thing. And so that's what right. this is all about, and that's why I called it Truth and Rhythm. Right. Wow. Beautiful, man. That's beautiful. And it's it's an honor to be here because there's so many like yourself preserving it. Because, you know, I had Lionel Richie on my show when I was at Sirius Radio, and I got to interview him. <clears throat> and I said, Lionel, man, what do you find different between today's music and the music that we made in the 70s and 80s and even the 60s? And he thought for a second and he looked at me and he said, D train, I'll tell you what's missing. He said, the melody. He said, think about it. And it hit me when the first time I heard, why do you build me a buttercup, baby? I can remember verbatim where I was when I heard um, Carol King's So Far Away. We were sitting on the front side of a road in a rainstorm. My father had to pull over. I was on vacation with him and his mother, my mother. We were going up to this mountain retreat, and we had to pull over because the rain was so hard, like Florida rain. And this is in the 70s, and Carol King came on uh, with, was so far away. So that, that type of music, the melody you remember, and, and I thought about it because I said, through the 90s, after the 80s music left, how many songs can you actually say you remember? Very few. You remember rhythms, but even in rock and roll, it, the, the whole dynamic changed after Dan, because rock and rollers could go like Dan Fogelberg, who a great songwriter. See, I listened to all of these guys all the way across the board because I was brought up in two worlds. My black world consisted of Aretha Franklin, James Brown, The Temptations, Marvin Gaye, um, Eddie, Eddie Kendricks, all of those guys, David Ruff. And then the other side of my world, in my pop world, was, was where I went to school at. And these kids were listening to Graham Central Station, Three Dog Night, you know, Led Zeppelin, um, Barbara Streisand. And I'm sitting up here going, so I got the best of both worlds inside of me. So when I create music, I'm, I'm remembering what it was like 
to walk down Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn with my dad and listen to Todd Rundgren sing Hello, It's Me. When I bought my first guitar, that was on the radio. And I've been a Todd Rundgren fan over the years. A great song. I love the Isley's version especially, though. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hello. (laughs) You mentioned about back in the day touring uh, with, uh, you know, George Clinton and all those other people. But as you look back in that, like, 80s era, you know, when D-Train was, you know, at its peak, what is one or two experiences from the road or stage that just are most unforgettable for you that stand out for whatever reason? It could be good. It could be bad. It could be funny. It could be whatever. I'll give you the bad first. (laughs) First bad thing I learned. We were playing in Washington, D.C., and I didn't know, and this is like 84, I didn't know that go-go, if you play anything other than go-go music, which is like drop the bomb, or that go-go, that, 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 that was the rhythm. Chuck Brown and the Soul Searches, that song. Um, if you weren't playing that, they didn't want to hear you. You can get up there and sing Walk On By all you want. They wouldn't go listen to it. And we were in a small... Coliseum. It was the Washington Coliseum. Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers went on and played one song for 45 minutes. And those people went absolutely crazy. And then we came on and we start off with Keep On. No, we start off with Walk On By. And I'm singing Walk On By and I'm into it. I'm 22. I'm like, yeah. And I'm looking around and all of a sudden, People started heading to the exit like a football game was over, dude. And I was like, okay. And I couldn't stop in the middle of the song. I said, don't leave. Don't leave. And, and my ego was crushed. Whatever I had that got me up on that stage was so crushed. But and by the end of Walk On By, which was the second song in the set, the entire arena was empty, except for Hubert's wife and his daughter and his sister-in-laws who were standing in front of the stage. Everybody else left. I was crushed. That's because they go they go go they go go away. <laughs> yeah, they go go away. <laughs> and what happened was I learned later you don't play anything other than go go in Washington, DC. I said, oh, okay. And so um my manager made it a little bit better, Tom Hoover. He said, Don't worry, we got paid. So if they left, we still got the money. I said, Okay. <laughs> so so he said, don't cry too much. It wasn't you. It was just that, you know, they only like this style of music. I said, okay. The best thing, um, I'd still have to go back that, that, to. That sounds like, just for a second, that sounds like when they uh, paired the Beastie Boys opening for Madonna back in the day or the Monkees with Jimi Hendrix or something like that, just a mismatch. Or even better, know? when they paired Prince with the Rolling Stones. Oh, yeah, I was at that. Yeah. and he I was there when he stage. got booed off stage. Oh, I was there. Oh, God. He was, was, was going to leave and never come back. And then Keith Richards, he said, Keith Richards came up to him and said, listen, man, you're talented, kid. You just can't, you can't give it up like that. You can't give up like that. Because he was just strange and different. I mean, it's a Rolling Stones concert. He didn't know not to come out there in a thong. You know, <laughs> and a raincoat. James, I, I, was, I was at that show and wow. I had, I, I, I convinced I had seven of my friends come to the show also. And mm-hmm. I had told them and, and spoken Prince up, you know, because I followed him from the beginning mm-hmm. and uh, they didn't really know who he was at that point. And so then he comes on and he gets stuff thrown at him. He gets booed off the stage and they're mm-hmm. like, what's the deal, Scott? <laughs> and I'm like, oh man. I was, but I, I was really, really mad and disgusted, you know, with seeing wow. that. And, wow. But then, a year later, he came back to the Santa Monica Civic by, on his mm-hmm. own and just was so successful. That was the beginning of him really starting to take off. Wow. Uh, but um, that was amazing to see. And just, you know, you talk about the competitive thing and like how you wanted to score and not let anything oh, yeah. get in your way. Prince, man, really had that in, in, in spades. And you could tell that when he came back and just, you know, came back to conquer. Well, you know, I would say one of the highlights of my career has to do with Prince. Two of the highlights. The first one was I get a phone call 
from a guy named Mars. Not Mars Day. I forgot Mars. I think it's Mars Brown. He's Prince's keyboard player. Mars Hayes. Mars Hayes. Mars calls my house. D train is Mars, man. What's going on, brother? Prince wants your blessing. Prince who? D train. Purple Rain Prince wants your blessing. I said, oh, oh, okay. Well, Mars, man, tell me you got my blessing. Tell me to call Hubert also. So he calls Hubert. They go on George Lopez at night. Prince performs You're the One. Turns it into a salsa, a samba. Then he played it for 21 nights at the L.A. Forum. You're the one for me. And he said, yo, D-Train, where you at? He dies. I get another phone call from Rob Mathis. He dies maybe a year later. I get a phone call from Rob Mathis. They want you in Boston at the Boston Pop Symphony Hall. They want you to go on tour with the Boston Pops. I said, I don't sing opera. I said, well, what am I going to do with the orchestra? He said, they only want you to sing one song. I said, what song? Purple Rain. And I get to Symphony Hall first night, and I'm singing Purple Rain. And if you know anything about operas and symphonies, most of the people sit there and then they When I finished singing Purple Rain, people were running down the aisles in the balcony going, y'all take your high five, man, high five, what's up? And they were not used to that behavior. <laughs> It turned into a rock concert quick. Well, I was going to say you brought church to it, yeah. Yeah, and it turned into a rock concert quick. We wound up doing Hyannis. I, I wound up opening up for Kenny Loggins, uh, the B-52s. And I always pointed up to heaven to him. Said, I know you got me this gig. And, uh, you know, I want to continue in that tradition that he started of being independent. Don't follow where they lead lead where they follow. And I say that to all the young musicians and artists coming up, don't follow where they lead, lead where they follow, create your own path and know your history, learn your history, go back to where they had records and crates and DJs used to have to carry them all over to their gigs and watch a video about old school thing. You learned that you blessed because all you got to do is carry an iPad to your show where they used to have to carry 40 records down a, a flight of subway stairs to get into Manhattan and they lived in Queens. It was horrible. You see that? Oh, wow. Yeah, you sitting up on stage with your crates, man. Yeah. Yeah, my, ba my, my, my back still talks about it today. <laughs> I, I, I guarantee y'all still having conversations. <laughs> yeah. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.